Vitamin C or ascorbic acid is much more than a vitamin. It is a molecule so essential for life that all plants and most animals are able to build it themselves, starting from glucose. Among mammals, humans are one of the very few exceptions, together with guinea pigs and bats, that cannot make their own vitamin C. Back in the millennia, our ancestors too were able to make their own vitamin C. But this ability has been somehow lost with evolution. Not because vitamin C ceased to be important, but likely because our ancestors were getting so much from food that it became unnecessary to build it themselves. Unfortunately, as you already know, our diet today is very different than our ancestors. Not only they would eat a lot more fresh fruit and vegetables, but they would also eat them without much processing and storage, all of which can cause major losses of vitamin C. Besides, they would also eat most of their food raw or undercooked, and cooking also destroys vitamin C. Even meat and fish, when eaten raw, were important sources of vitamin C. As a result of this evolutionary trick, Nowadays, most people do not get from food the amount of vitamin C that they would have made by themselves hadn't they lost the necessary enzyme to build it in the liver. Many researchers have tried to estimate what exactly this amount would be to determine the optimal dose of vitamin C to remedy this metabolic disadvantage of humans. Nobel laureate Linus Pauling spent the last 40 years of his life trying to figure this out. By looking at the amounts of vitamin C made by other vertebrates, including gorillas and chimpanzees, that are still able to make their own vitamin C, Dr. Pauling concluded that the daily need of vitamin C for an adult human is at least 2 grams a day, but should be increased in stressful periods. He himself used to take 6 grams of vitamin C every day and did so religiously until his death at 93 years of age. And here we come across an apparent controversy of classical nutrition. Although it has recently been increased, the current RDA for vitamin C is set at 75 mg for women and 90 mg for men, to be increased by 35 mg by smokers, since smoke destroys some of it. These amounts are about 20 times lower than the dose identified by the above-mentioned studies of comparative physiology. Where do these numbers come from? As you recall from one of our first videos, the discovery of vitamin C has been historically linked to its key role in the prevention of scurvy, the collagen deficiency disease that used to claim numerous victims among sailors in long sea voyages whose diet was devoid of vitamin C. First and foremost, Vitamin C is a cofactor in the metabolic pathway leading to the formation and stabilization of collagen, the main structural protein of our connective tissue. Our bones, teeth, gums, skin, tendons, and blood vessels all need collagen for strength and elasticity. If vitamin C is deficient, collagen cannot perform its function and our connective tissues start to wear out. Gums bleed, teeth are loose, wounds are slow to heal, and the risk for thrombosis increases because of low vessel elasticity. These are indeed the first symptoms of scurvy. We now know that a vitamin is called a vitamin because its deficiency results in a disease, which in the case of vitamin C is scurvy. So it makes perfect sense that the RDA is set at 75 to 90 mg. This is the necessary amount to prevent scurvy. However, if we want to take advantage of the many other benefits that are offered by vitamin C to maximize health, then our intake should be several folds higher than that. Let's examine some of the other advantages of vitamin C. Vitamin C is a powerful antioxidant molecule. While vitamin E is fat-soluble and protects our cell membranes, vitamin C is water-soluble and protects the inside of our cells and our bloodstream from oxidative stress. Vitamin C also modulates some detoxifying enzymes in our body, protecting us from many environmental pollutants and heavy metals such as lead, mercury, and cadmium, and helps us detoxify drugs. 
in our stomach. It prevents the reaction of food nitrates and nitrates with amino acids to form nitrosamines, which are carcinogens. In our intestine, it enhances iron absorption and limits some of the damages associated with its prooxidant strength. These are two of the reasons why vitamin C is associated to a lower risk for cancers of the gastrointestinal tract. In our cell membranes, vitamin C works together with glutathione and some phenolic antioxidants to regenerate vitamin E, so that vitamin E can maintain its biological activity. Vitamin C also has an anti-inflammatory activity, as it breaks down histamine. In general, vitamin C boosts our immune system. It enables white blood cell formation and protects them from oxidative damage. Besides, by allowing for proper collagen formation, it enhances the barrier activity against pathogens of many tissues, first and foremost, our skin. The immunostimulatory activity of vitamin C has long been known. One of the pioneer vitamin C researchers, physician Friedrich Robert Klenner, has experimented with mega doses of vitamin C since the 1940s, publishing numerous research papers and books in which he described the advantages of using vitamin C as a therapy for a wide range of illnesses. In his first publication, he described how he cured 60 out of 60 polio patients by injecting them intravenously with a staggering 100 to 300 grams of vitamin C as neutral pH sodium ascorbate. He then went on to test vitamin C finding positive outcomes for over 30 diseases. Dr. Klenner believed that mega doses of vitamin C should routinely be given to all cases of infections, burns, and many cases of intoxications, and he suggested that all patients should, quote, get large doses of vitamin C in all pathological conditions while the physician ponders the diagnosis, as this could save their life in many cases. Dr. Klenner's work on vitamin C drew a lot of attention in the past, so much so that many hospitals actually followed his advice and routinely gave mega doses of vitamin C before every surgery, dramatically reducing surgical and post-surgical complications and infections. So where do we find vitamin C in food? Everybody knows that citrus fruits are rich in vitamin C, oranges, lemons, grapefruit. Moreover, these fruits also contain some particular phenolic substances called flavonoids that enhance its biological activity. A middle-sized orange provides by itself the amount of vitamin C necessary to prevent scurvy. Orange juice is also a good source of vitamin C, but must be drunk immediately after squeezing the orange to prevent light and oxygen from damaging vitamin C. In pre-packaged pasteurized OJ, some vitamin C has likely been added back to make up for processing losses. There are, however, some fruits that have even more vitamin C than oranges, and these are strawberries, kiwifruit, lychee, guava, and black currant. Rose hips are exceptionally rich sources of vitamin C, and even more so, some tropical fruits such as acerola, camu camu, and the richest of it all, the Australian kakadu plum, which can have up to a hundred times more vitamin C than oranges, that is, an astonishing 5 grams of vitamin C per 100 grams of fruit. Among vegetables, broccoli, peppers, tomatoes, and Brussels sprouts are all rich sources of vitamin C. Sun-dried tomatoes can provide a lot of it. In general, all fruits and vegetables provide some vitamin C, as long as they're eaten raw or very quickly steamed. Remember that vitamin C is a very unstable vitamin. It is rapidly lost with processing and exposure to light and air. It is water-soluble also, so washing or boiling vegetables will wash it away. And it is heat-sensitive, so cooking destroys most of it. Some typical deficiency symptoms of vitamin C are swollen and bleeding gums, your toothbrush becomes pink, slower wound healing, easy formation of bruises on the skin, pinpoint hemorrhages on the skin caused by slight bleeding, increased susceptibility to sore throats and colds, and more specific symptoms such as fatigue, weakness, 
joint pain, and loss of appetite. My advice to you is to get as much vitamin C as possible through food sources, plus a daily supplement of 500 mg of vitamin C to be increased to 1 or 2 grams during the winter season or when the cold viruses start circulating in case of infections or physical stresses such as wounds or burns or in preparation for surgeries or traumas, for example, before going to the dentist to extract a tooth. If we have access to some of the extraordinary rich natural sources of vitamin C, such as the Australian plums, these can of course replace the supplements. One of the most widely known uses of vitamin C to date is in the prevention and treatment of the common cold, following an extremely popular book written by Linus Pauling, Vitamin C and the Common Cold. On this, I disagree with most nutrition textbooks, which downplay the role of supplemental vitamin C in preventing and reducing the symptoms and duration of colds. Not only by personal experience, but when I look at the evidence. The evidence is there, although clouded by many trials who tested ridiculously low dosages of 200 mg or so, which of course found no effect for vitamin C. If we look at the clinical trials using 1 or 2 grams of vitamin C, they consistently show that vitamin C reduces symptoms and duration of colds. The key successful use of vitamin C in preventing the onset of a cold is timing. You have to get it at the very first symptoms that make you suspect you may be getting a cold, before it fully sets in. Then immediately take one gram of vitamin C and then keep taking one gram every hour until you go to bed for a maximum of 10 hours. Vitamin C is water soluble and has no known toxicity because at high dosages most of it is not even absorbed and what's absorbed can be easily flushed out with the urine. The only possible side effect is that in some people it may cause diarrhea because the part that is not absorbed reaches the colon and attracts water. It is mostly to prevent this undesired side effect that an upper level of 2 grams has been set for vitamin C, although most individuals can safely exceed such amount with no side effects.